So we are going to go to Ephesians 2. I want to read. Uh, let me get this. I want to read Ephesians 2, the last section of Ephesians 2 that we're going to finish tonight. Um, so uh, verse 19 down through verse 22, it says this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. All right, so we're talking, we're kind of picking up these last couple of verses uh, of, of Ephesians chapter two before we move into chapter three. And last week we talked about the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The foundations of the apostles and prophets. We talked about kind of what maybe is the, one of the traditional views of uh, apostles, what it takes to be an apostle. We looked at Acts chapter 1 and, and some other scriptures on apostleship. Uh, and, you know, there are other people who believe that, that there are still apostles today. I don't think that's a, a reason to split faith with them. I just say... If you believe that apostles are for today, you, you, what I know is that you got that because you, you're looking at church history and what you think, what you've surmised from it, not from biblical instruction, because biblical instruction would tend to make you think the apostles were a specific group that Jesus picked at the beginning. Um, and so if you've expanded that, that's okay. And the other thing I would say is this whole idea of being built on the uh, foundation of the apostles and prophets, what did that mean? Do you remember kind of what we talked about? What, what is this building on the foundation of the apostles and prophets what's he referring to what's he talking about any idea all right uh the what do, what do we have here in the second half of this book what do we call this this half of the book this well the half this is the new testament so when they got together at the Council of Nicaea after Constantine made Christianity legal and then uh, required, um, you know, interesting, interesting transition. But when they got together and said, well, what is the actual books of the New Testament? What books belong and what books don't? One of the primary criterion was authoritative authorship, meaning that there is a clear line between who wrote this and an apostle one of the original apostles. Most of them we traced to Paul because he wrote half of the New Testament, half of the books of the New Testament. Also, Luke and Acts would be connected to Paul because Luke was a traveling companion of Paul's. You've got John, one of the apostles. You've got Matthew, one of the apostles. You've got Mark, who is said to have taken Peter's story, which is also why they believe Mark was the first gospel written, which seems pretty evident from archaeology and geography and all the stuff that we know about uh, the New Testament. Uh, so, and Peter being the first person's gospel that was written down, would, that would make sense, right? Central figure in the church. So uh, we ha they trace these things back. And then you've got you know, the Apostle John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You've got Jude and, and James that are connected to Jesus directly and, and in fellowship with the apostles and the, and the early leaders of the church. And so they kind of had all these things and they're like, we are connecting these things to the apostles. So the first pieces of the church that were laid where the apostles were called into, into fellowship, into discipleship with Jesus. They were taught specifically, and then Jesus told them, the Spirit is going to bring to mind all the things that you've learned, all the things you know, so that you can share them with other people. And then they wrote a lot of it down. And now here we are today still looking at something that was written almost 2,000 years ago and building on it. Everything that's been built over the centuries in between was built on this. Everything was built on the work and the testimony, the story, the writing, the, the, the preaching of the apostles uh, and the prophets. And so that early first century, you know, the first bit of it that was there, the first uh, group of people that were there, that first bit, everything comes off of that. And it's, it's kind of that way that it, it was designed to be built, the church, throughout the ages, Today, over 2 billion people call themselves Christian. The Lord knows who's Christians and who aren't. I don't, that's not my thing. But 
Two billion people in the world call themselves Christians. That's a pretty phenomenal building on top of 12 guys who, when push came to shove the night before Jesus died, took off running, right? It's a pretty big deal. And so they are the foundation. But then he kind of bounces off of that into what we really want to pick up tonight, which is, and Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So we don't do a lot of building on stones today, especially not foundation buildings on stones. We don't like, when we dig down into the ground, we use cinder block, we use concrete, we, but we don't usually go to a quarry and dig stones out and bury them under the ground as part of the foundation of a building. But that was the typical construction of that day is that they used stones as the strongest common material that they could find. And a cornerstone in that building idea, in that way of building, that methodology of building, was really, really important for the building being built in a way that it would stand and would not collapse under its own weight. So uh, this statement about Jesus as the chief cornerstone comes from Isaiah 28. So in a little bit, 10 minutes or something, we're going to go back and read Isaiah 28, where this comes from, so we can find out what, what it was about, what does it mean. But there is a, a difference, I don't know if you can imagine, maybe you can think with me out loud a little bit, the difference between the apostles being the foundation and Jesus being the cornerstone. So they're not the same. Like Jesus and the apostles are not the same here. Jesus is the chief cornerstone and the apostles are the foundation so what do you think when paul writes that what do you think he's referring to as the difference between you know the foundation stones and the chief cornerstone any ideas yeah hey just so people who are listening in can hear you Yeah, yeah, and I think that him using Jesus as the cornerstone is referring to the spiritual reality you're talking about, which is you can build on anything you want, but if you don't build, we know this, if you don't build your life on Jesus, it's not going to stand. Good. But what do you, like, why do you think he's, any idea of, like, the difference between cornerstone, foundation? Nobody has an idea? Charlie? Okay. Yeah. 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 It's very real that if you get the cornerstone wrong, the building's wrong. Everything about the building in that ancient way of building was built around the geometry and the strength of the cornerstone. So I'm going to kind of roll through a couple of the things here. The foundation. Uh, was both the alignment uh, and the placement of the foundation. They rested on the nature and position of the cornerstone. When you wanted to build a house, you positioned the house based on the squareness and the spot at which you placed that cornerstone. And everything aligned itself off of that spot. And everything kind of rested into that cornerstone so that if you removed it, it, it everything would move. Everything would shift because that cornerstone is holding everything in place. So the picture of the apostles as foundation and the cornerstone as Jesus, how, how does that happen uh, in the building of believers and the building of the church? Like why? Because he talks about both. In verse 21, it's the whole building is joined to become a holy temple. So we, the collective church, are the building. But then in verse 22, and in him you too are being built. It's you individually. So how does, when we talk about Jesus as the chief cornerstone and the apostles at the foundation, how does that relate to us individually and as a church today that Jesus is the cornerstone and the apostles of the foundation for us? Bob. Well, the big difference is obviously the cornerstone is stronger than the rest of the foundation. Right. Mm-hmm. And for us, oh, I'm sorry, and for us to build on that, we have to 
go to that right all the time. And, you know, that's the difference I see. I, I, I just believe that, uh, well, I know that that's where we're going to get our strengths. We can't, we've got, got to always go back and resort to that. Yeah. That's why that's different than when you say what's the difference. Yeah. It's a big difference. We're weak and he's strong. He's yeah. Our power. Yep. Our strength. Yep. Yeah, I think you, I mean, I think you see it because the, there's no doubt that much has been built on the apostles. But when you watch their story in the Gospels, you can see the difference between the apostles as just free agents and then the apostles who are connected to the cornerstone. Because Jesus says at the end of it, I'm leaving, but don't worry, my spirit's coming. I'm not going to leave you alone. And, and so I will abide in you and you will abide in me. And, there, and, and so you see this like running away at the crucifixion followed by going off and hiding and going back to fishing and finally winding up on a mountain and Jesus is ascending up into heaven and they're just staring up and the angels have to show up and say, don't keep staring up to the sky. Go, he's going to come with the spirit. And, and then, man, the church launches in power because the cornerstone they're all resting on the strength of the cornerstone. And so the foundation pieces become really foundation to an awful lot, but they only become that because of the strength of the cornerstone. Good. Other thoughts? If you went to uh, Israel right now, which I think would be awesome and cool, my, my wife thinks that would be a terrible idea, dangerous, and we'd probably die, but I think <laughs> it would be incredible to, uh, to go to Israel. And if you were able to go into the temple, they can show you in the foundation, some of the foundations of Herod's temple. And they can show you uh, some of these stones that are, when you consider the, the technology that was there versus what we have today, the power and the you know, machinery and everything we have today versus what they had then, these stones are unbelievably massive. The, the largest one that we found is, I, I, I don't know if, I can give you the sense of this size, but 55 feet long, 11 feet wide, 14 feet high, okay? So that's a one stone, 55 feet long. So right now, if you were in our auditorium, our auditorium is about 60 feet long. So it's almost as long as our auditorium, right? And maybe a, it's as high as our auditorium, one stone, and maybe one quarter of the way across it is that crazy a stone that big and now here they are moving it with what well how did they cut this get it into place and move? like isn't that incredible but it gives you when you know those buildings in that time were built and this is a mountain that it's built on so it's not unsettled ground it's not unsolid ground but they built it not only because it needed foundation sturdiness to hold it up it needed to be right it needed to be square. It needed to be fit together in the right way. And so this giant stone gets placed exactly right so that they can build. That's the, one of the foundations for Herod's temple. It's this stone that just, you know, the, the building rises up in magnificence on top of that. But and so underneath of all this, the unseen, this is one of the cornerstone of foundation applications. The unseen is what's holding up what's seen. It's what is, the, the, everything is resting on this unseen part. You know, there's not a lot of um, publicity for foundations. Do you know what I mean? It's, I mean, everybody likes a found, everybody wants a good foundation, but you, you don't really, it's not really spotlighted a lot. So think about that in us today. The foundation is the unseen, so what is the scene? We are. And our lives how we are built on the foundation are supposed to represent the rightness of the foundation, the sturdiness of the foundation, the, the, the correct placement of it, the, the um, strength of the foundation, which is why when people reject Christianity, most of the time what they're rejecting is the building that's been built on top of the foundation doesn't look like a building that's worth a very good foundation. And so they're like, well, I don't, I don't, because they don't see the foundation. What they see is you. They see the building on top of it. Or they see the church, you know, and the reputation of the church or their experience with the church. And that doesn't represent a foundation that's perfectly fit and exact and everything's being held up by it. It represents something else to them. 
And so the unseen foundation is what supports the seen, and it would be good for the seen to reflect the greatness of the foundation that we are built on. The, the cornerstone is the only part of the building large enough to hold the weight, and that's specifically picked and designed because it could hold the weight. The application for that in our lives, a lot like what Patty was saying, is you can build your life on anything you want, and some things will hold up for a little bit. Even a bad foundation will hold up for a little bit, but over time, there's only one foundation that won't crack and crumble, that won't collapse your life, and that is a foundation of our Lord, building it on Jesus Christ. And that, that is why Paul is using this picture. Um, the other part is not just the strength of holding it up, but this alignment thing, that everything in the building is built off the alignment of this. How, why did that aspect of the cornerstone matter when Paul is talking about Jesus as the cornerstone and Jesus as the thing that, create, that, that the building is aligned with, that creates the alignment of the building? What do you think? Yeah, they're, he's using terminology that they would understand, for sure. And he's talking about a cornerstone they would understand. Right. Yes. We don't align correctly. It's just like, you know, you're kind of yeah. stacked little blocks. And yeah. A Lego sits on top of a Lego because it aligns with it. Yep. And if you don't align a Lego on top of a Lego, it doesn't, doesn't work. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That, that foundation is yeah. I think this is huge for us as believers, this alignment thing, because what it means, and, and this is all over Christianity today, it's one, of, it's one of the things that grieves my soul. I was just talking with George about this a little bit. Most, a lot of believers, and, and a lot of big ministries and big, you know, whatever, People come to Scripture to try to see in Scripture what they want to see in Scripture. See, this is, mis, this is misuse. This is not alignment. You come to Scripture to read Scripture so Scripture will tell you what the truth is. Even if I thought I knew it, but Scripture tells me something different, Scripture's right, right? This is the Word of God. So uh, it bothers me that people come to you know, some uh, of Paul's epistles or the Gospels or whatever, and they, they see what they want to see. Uh, I've, I've read books recently on what is uh, the nature of God's judgment or what is hell or how, you know, how about this angry God in the Old Testament? And, and because today we have squeamishness about a God who judges, it is people are trying to find a way to position God in a way that betrays or minimizes his judgment. And the bad news for them is you don't go to Scripture to color Scripture. You go to Scripture for Scripture to color you. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that the caricature that's been made of God as this angry God in the Old Testament is a, an accurate portrayal because the same God that we see in the Old Testament is the same God we see in the New Testament. He's the same throughout it. So there are aspects of his grace that are so abundantly clear in the Old Testament and bringing them to light helps us understand this God that, that seems to many people to be you know, so ready to judge people. But at the same time, we don't get away with like, well, God is too nice to judge. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't happen that way. God is the judge. He is the righteous judge. He sees perfectly. He sees exactly. He has provided a way for his mercy to show up when our time for judgment comes. He's poured out his grace through Jesus Christ in love beyond description. But make no doubt about it, God is a just judge. So there is judgment for every human being. It, my hope is that God has provided mercy and grace for me in that day. But it does not take, not take away from the fact that God is the perfect, righteous, holy judge. And he is good in judging. That the cancer of sin that tries to demolish this world, you may have seen some of the effects of it. A uh, year ago, a little more than a year ago, we had a guy here from... Hope for Justice named Tim Nelson, who shared with us their quest in the world today to try to end slavery in today's world. And most of the slavery is of young children into sexual trafficking. You know, they, but it's not all of it. 
There was a lady that they, they uh, rescued in Los Angeles uh, last year after I believe it was something like 40 or 50 years in slavery as a house servant to a wealthy family in Los Angeles. There are centers in America where people are imported from other countries to work in essentially servitude because they have no rights, they have no say, they have no voice, they have no anything. And they are at the mercy of the one who owns them. Um, And so there is evil in this world. And if God were just too nice to judge, he would be too nice. Because evil needs its day. It deserves its day in judgment. It deserves to be removed. It's kind of like saying, you went to the doctor and he told you you have cancer. And he said, but you know, I don't really want to cut into your body. I, I want to, I'm a nice doctor. Be like, well, I want a good doctor instead, please. Right? Because that's, you, it's not good to leave sin. And, and so God is so righteous and so just. So this idea that we go to Scripture to see what we'd like to see and to, to make it more palatable, we go to Scripture so Scripture tells us what the truth is. And when I have a hard time getting my head around it, yeah, lots of times, but that doesn't change that the Bible's right and I need to find the way for that to, to be processed in my life, for me to embrace it by faith. And I think for our life day in and day out, it's not just theologians out there trying to answer big questions. It's in my life. I don't get to pick and choose which parts of the Bible apply to me and which parts don't. I don't get to say, well, I want to be an honest person, but you know this whole sexual ethic thing that's in the Scripture... I don't really care about that. That's that's a little too inconvenient. I mean, I'm doing most of it, but you don't get to pick and choose. You don't get to say, well, you know, I'm going to go to church on Sunday and worship, and then I'm going to go out Monday, and I'm going to let my temper just bleed out all over all the people I have at work that I don't... You don't get to pick and choose. The Bible is supposed to instruct you. We are supposed to embrace it. And so I know we're all in process. We're all growing, and that's part of God's thing, but we should grow with enough humility and enough, um, like adoration and, and, and embrace of scripture to say, man, when I've fallen short, I, I got work to do. <laughs> Not, well, it's fine. <laughs> and there's too many of Christians who are like very flippant with scripture, very flippant. Even with things like uh, when, when we're told in Hebrews not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, meaning be regular, be faithful, be intentional about gathering together as the body of Christ. We do it on Sunday morning. We've got small groups that go on. We got this for Wednesday night. We got, so there's gathering together. Do not forsake it. How many Christians write that off? And they do it by coloring scripture a little bit. Well, I can worship God anywhere. God is everywhere and, and I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. So they color it, but they ignore something that's very clear in scripture. See, so this is what I'm saying. When we go to scripture, Jesus is the key, chief cornerstone. We go to the cornerstone to find alignment with him. Because when you're aligned with Jesus, you're in the right position. You're straight. When you're not aligned with Jesus, big problems ensue. And we keep trying to tamp out fires, but we never get there. So alignment is really, really, really important. George. Okay. So I think it's all about having the Holy Spirit. Yes. And, you know, when you get into the Word, if you're not born again person, then sometimes you will twist the Scripture. So do you understand? Like, Yeah. Oh, yeah. The label itself, I'm a Christian, is not enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And if I'm actually a believer, in other words, I've been born again. The Holy Spirit's taken up residence in me. But even people who have the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the injunction is don't quench the Spirit of God. So we're not supposed to take water and douse his work and say, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Spirit, but no thank you. But I, I think where I get confused is um, we're believers. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit. So how could there be so much division sometimes, so yeah. much confusion? Uh, God is not a God of confusion. So yeah. why would we be twisting this? How could that be if we have the Holy Spirit? Why would we be yeah. twisting? Why would he allow us to twist and, and just say, uh, just explain it. Well, that's, I think it's a great question. It goes to the, the nature and the plan and the mercy of God. But I think we could go back, we could take it out of the church context into the other group of God's people in history, which is Israelites, where God 
gave them specific instructions that were keep these and live, don't keep these and die, basically. And he let them twist it all over the place too. They wrote a whole second book to twist it. You know what I mean? There was a Torah and then there was the Talmud. And the Talmud would tell you, really, you needed to read the Talmud because that gave you the, you know, you're not allowed to this and you should always that and whatever. And so people have twisted God's word. God's people have twisted God's word throughout scripture. It is for us to have an earnest heart. It's the choice we all have, each one of us. And I'm saying, don't we want to be the faithful ones that come to God's word with an open heart, with an honest mind? Not that we know all the truth or we see everything clearly, but we have the posture of soul that God will instruct us and we, we will hear him. Um, even if we're confused, we'll hear him. And I think there are believers around the world who have that convincedness of the spirit. I think there are organizations, there's weights to organizations that begin to make that difficult because even now you see it in the United Methodist Church where they are creating two separate United Methodist Church over a division over whether homosexuality is acceptable or not acceptable, really. And that, to your point, how can you twist scripture to such a degree where, where you're normalizing something that God has clearly said, this is, this is not what I created, this is not the way it should be. Um, but you do it because you have membership and you've got you know, agendas and you've got, and so there's, there's pressures on organizations that sometimes are good things, but a lot of times are bad things too. And so I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but it's humanity, it's our flesh, and it's God's allowance. He's kind of, he gave it, he trusted this to us. And that, just like he entrusted us with the witness, and many people don't share him. We are the plan. <laughs> How does the world know about Jesus? We, us, us. What if we don't do it? What if we got other stuff we want to do? Plan B is, there is no plan B. It's us. We're the ones to go out and share. So there's, there's that just kind of like patience, greatness, goodness of God in that, that allows his people to do what, whatever we choose to do but then holds us to account on it in the end. All right, so I got off on a little bit on that. Uh, let's go back to Isaiah chapter uh, 28 where this first comes up, and this is where Paul is referring back to when he uses this, this picture of the chief cornerstone. And I want to read a bunch of this to you, okay? So Because I want you to get the picture of where this shows up. It's not in this self-help, uh, super positive uh, book where it's like, the chief cornerstone, oh, it's going to be so awesome when he shows up and you're going to be so happy. It's not that at all, okay? So Isaiah chapter 28, I'm going to start at verse one because Isaiah is a prophet that is confronting a sinful nation of God's people who have rejected him. And specifically, even in this chapter, he's coming against those who are God's people and those who are leaders of God's people who have led them down a path to thinking that they're okay when they're not okay. So... Verse, 20, uh, verse 1 of chapter 28. Woe to the wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, to the fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, that, to that city, the pride of those, who lay, who, those laid low by wine. See, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong, like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like a driving rain and a flooding downpour. He will throw it forcefully to the ground. That wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards will be trampled underfoot. That fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, will be like figs ripe before the harvest. As soon as the people see them and take them in hand, they swallow them. In that day, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people. So in other words, they're very impressed with their harvest, with their ability, their, the beauty of their land. They're like, we are wonderful. And they're like, see how good we are. See how much God loves us. Look at our land. Look how beauty it is. Look how much... A harvest we got isn't life sweet but the lord will be the the wreath he will be a spirit of justice the one who sits in judgment a source of strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate and these also stagger from wine and reel from beer priests and prophets stagger from beer and are befuddled with wine they reel from beer they stagger when seeing visions they stumble when rendering decisions all the tables are covered with vomit and there is not a spot without filth not a pretty picture now, is there? Yeah. In other words, their self-assurance and then their self-indulgence has led them where it always does, to a huge mess. A mess that uh, you can talk yourself into the whole way down that this isn't that bad, this isn't that bad, this is, until all of a sudden it's like, this is such a stink. This is such an awful mess. 
this is where Ephraim, which is a, a word for the northern kingdom, this is where they've got. Verse 9, who is he trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? To children weaned from their milk, to those just taken from the breast. For it is, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. Well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people. Ooh. In other words, uh, we've got an answer for that. We've got an answer for that. We've got an, we have a rule. We have a little thing. Just, just change a little bit. Just change a little bit. Okay, if that's your answer, God says, I will speak to my people with the lips of foreign people. What's he saying? Foreigners, Foreigners are coming. And it's not so much their lips that are going to do the speaking. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's the sword coming in. So this is Isaiah warning, as the prophets did over and over again, warning God's people that you are turning a deaf ear to God and God is coming to set it right. Very well then, verse 11, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the resting place. Let the weary rest and this is the place of repose, but they would not listen. What's God inviting them to? Well, he, he's reminding them that once upon a time, I said, this is going to be your promised land. This is your place of rest. This is your place of my goodness and my grace. But what did you do? They would not listen. They turned away from the God who said, I would provide you with peace of all your surrounding neighbors. So then the word of the Lord will come to them and will become, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here and a little there, so that as they go, they will fall backward and they will be injured and snared and captured. God says, you want to live by rules, uh, you're going to fall by rules. You're going to stumble and trip, and when you go to battle, you're going to be defeated. Therefore, hear what the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem. You boast, we have entered into a, covenant, into a covenant with death. With the realm of the dead, we have made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us, for we have made a lie our refuge and a falsehood our hiding place. So the leaders of Israel have said, we've made a deal with death. Death's not going to touch us. This is pride. This is arrogance. This is like, you can't touch us. We're God's people, right? So this is where the promise shows up, verse 16. So this is what the sovereign Lord said. See, I lay in a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. And I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it comes, it will carry you away. Morning after morning, by day and by night, it will sweep through. The understanding of this message will bring sheer terror. So in the middle of this is this promise of a cornerstone. And what's he saying about that cornerstone? He's saying, there is judgment coming. And the only hope that you have is that I'm bringing a cornerstone and whoever relies on it, whose ever life rests on it, whoever's built in alignment with it, they will not be stricken with panic. They will be safe and secure. But everyone who is sure in themselves, whose schemes and plans and made up stories and lies and their, their masks with people, judgment comes and washes it all away. And God says, you think you have a covenant with death? I have annulled it. There is no covenant with death. You are not immune. You are not exempt. You will face exactly what you deserve for the stuff that you've done. And he's speaking specifically to the leaders of God's people who have led God's people into false assurance in their self-centeredness and in their sin. It's pretty, pretty hefty, right? The idea of you have to make sure that what you're building in your life is being built on Christ. Not on this other stuff. Not on the, like Georgia was just saying, not on the title Christian. On the actual Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of my life. There's difference between those two. Not what I call myself, what I present my, what I introduce myself as, not the, 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 the mask that I present to the world, but is my life actively being built on and in alignment with Jesus Christ or not? And that, it's as simple as that, 
but it's as deep as that. And that is where that cornerstone things comes in. It is the true refuge and the solid ground for us as believers. Jesus is the true cornerstone. Pretty, pretty crazy that Paul goes back into that passage. And it gives you a sense of kind of the context in which he's pulling out of. So maybe the context in which he's talking to. That there are believers who are living like, this is easy. I do whatever I want. And he's like, no, you're being built into a holy temple. You're being built into the dwelling place of God. Act like it. Live like it. Be built on Jesus. Be built on him. Wow. Yeah. So the, the religious leaders of that day, they led all these people and God destroyed them. They, or they're, they're in hell. Well, we don't know. God knows yeah, where they are. Okay. But they certainly were judged. And the judgment that God talked about in the Old Testament was more about you will lose your position, you will lose your wealth, and you will right. lose your life. So I don't know yeah, if they're okay, in so hell or not. My second question is what, because there's leaders today mm-hmm. that are, uh, uh, I would assume most of them are really saved, born again, yeah. leading people down wrong paths. Yeah. And they will be judged for that yeah. also. Yeah. But they absolutely are still saved. They're still I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. I don't know. The I Lord know. knows. And that's to me, that's good. Because uh-huh. I, if I were to judge, I'd probably judge wrong because I judge in very limited view or whatever. God knows who's his and who's not his. God knows how to judge and how to call people into account. Um, There are probably stories we could all tell about how God brought someone who was doing what was wrong to right, you know, in their life. But thankfully, God is a judge. So he, but he is, what I'm saying, he is a judge. You know, it's, he's not like, oh, well, I don't know what to do. They're a preacher and they're probably my child. And not, not like he's, his hands are tied. He knows what to do, and he's going to do it, and they're going to answer to him, just like these guys did. Yeah. Yeah. Dwight. Um, okay. Um, my first question would be, um, since you're talking about uh, the chief cornerstone and you were, talk- you were talk- talking about the idea of knowing someone's salvation, Uh, The Bible talks about how the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we have that assurance. Yes. The believer has the assurance of salvation. A question I've asked a few different people. I don't know if you can answer this question. Do you believe God ever, by his spirit, gives us an idea or reveals someone else's salvation? Uh, Well, I don't think I have any biblical place to say yes to that. Um, do I think he can? Sure he can. Do I think he does? Um, you know, the, I think my, the fallibility of my humanity probably enters into that a lot. So do I think I know some people that are saved? Yeah, I do. I think I know what smells like Jesus and looks like the Spirit's work and whatever. But I hold back that, that finality of, yeah, they're in. Just like I kind of go like, I think those are God's children. And I think I, think I have confidence to the limit of my humanity, you know, with my brothers and sisters in church. And, you know, God, if people are faking it, that's between them and God. You know what I mean? Okay. And my my second question would be, you're talking tonight about building on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Yes. Uh, The first question was about, can I know whether or not someone else is saved? This question would be, how do I know I'm building on the chief cornerstone? Yes. Yes. Because sometimes... You're like, I don't feel this. And then sometimes, like you were talking about, some people have that self-assurance. I am building on the chief's cornerstone when they're not. Yeah. So there's some people who feel like they're not, yeah. but they are. And then there's other people who feel Great. like they are, but they're Great not. So question. how do you have assurance that you're building on the chief cornerstone? Fantastic question, Dwight. All right, give me some ideas, guys. How do you? Cha? This book. All right. Yeah. So if we want to know whether or not we're in alignment with God, we need to look at that book. Yeah. I mean, we go, uh, and this came up, I think, a couple of weeks ago. If we go by our feelings, yes. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll mess that up every single time. Yeah. There are a lot of things in the Bible that I don't like. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. It's like mm-hmm. there's a lot of truth that I don't particularly like. Yeah. But it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. So that's the heart of what it's talking about when it's talking about a cornerstone. Yep. It's, it's got to be true. It's mm -hmm. got to be 100% true. And I think that's the biggest thing that we have outside of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Is God's Word. He gave us that. If we want to know whether or not we are doing what we should be doing or we're living how we should be living, it's got to go off the Bible. Yeah. If it's out of alignment with what the Bible's saying, we're wrong. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Word of God is a is a huge resource, the probably foundational resource that we have as believers for evaluating what you're talking about. Am I building on Jesus or not? Uh, because even as Jesus uses that picture of building on a foundation of stone or sand, he says, anyone who does these hears my sayings and does them, anyone who hears these sayings and does not do them. So it's it's am I following am, am i serious about the teaching of the new testament of jesus christ the, the principles that i learned am i am i just reading it for knowledge am i reading it to puff up am i or am i reading it to embrace to to instruct my life to guide and direct me so the word of god in the way that it reveals the will of god as well as the character of god is very primary in in answering some of that question other ideas piece that I, you know, and I don't understand it. I know, I, I know it's the spirit yeah. and I know that I'm doing the right thing. And I ask God, um, sh show me. And he, he will show me and yeah. say, no, don't go that way. Yeah. Most of the time I hear it. But then when I feel this <coughs> peace, and I don't know if it's a feeling, it, it's just, you know, yeah. wait, lift it up, like go for it. Yeah. And, you know, I think the key to what you're saying, Bob, is this, that you want to know God's plan more so than how do I know God's plan or how do I know the right thing the fact that you're asking and the position of a heart that says God I, I want to do this if you want me to do it I don't want to do even if I'm wrong about my outcome there the the place that I'm coming from is something that God works in and through to allow because it's it's more than just give me the right answer and go away yeah. it's That's there's a faith, faith and there's a embracing of his will, his goodness, his, his work in my life that drives me forward. So what you're talking about is how's my relationship with the Lord? So what Charlie says is the word of God, which is true. What I find in the word of God is who God is. And, and as I learn who he is and as he, he speaks to me through his word and through his spirit, I know who he is and I grow close to him. And as I'm close to him, now I can be much clearer on am I building my life on Jesus or not? If I'm, you know, there are people in, in all throughout my ministry that have been in crisis when they show up to talk to me um, because something in their life blew up. And the ones that, uh, that have walked with the Lord and, and been tenderhearted towards Him and served Him and, and been, you know, Godward in their lives, I say to them, listen, you just got to keep that heart and go forward, and, and God will show you, and God will be there in it. But the ones who come in and have set Christ on the shelf for the last 10 years or five years or whatever, and then they're like, now I'm in crisis. It's like, well, we got a lot to talk about <laughs> because you, God is not something you just, it's not a, just a phone call to an operator on the other end like QVC or something, and okay, now I'll take three of those, and then it's a relationship, right? And so how's your relationship? How's your connectedness with the Lord? As you learn who He is and you, you engage with what He's saying, is there trust for Him? Do you see Him at work in your life? And then it brings out what you're talking about, which is, Lord, show me. I want, I want this decision to be your decision, so show me. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And I think that trust gets expressed in that God-word heart, even that question. Yeah, Eileen. I think for me, uh, I don't know the Bible. I'm learning every day, every time I come here. It's mm -hmm. more and more. Um, but for me, I have a dialogue um, of prayer in the morning, uh, usually while I'm getting ready for work or driving, and I'm like, show me, help me to be quiet, be still, be humble, and help yeah. me to represent you the best way that you yeah. want me to. Yeah. And I just, I have a dialogue with him and mm -hmm. I just find myself when I start, when I don't start the day that day, work just really 
thoughts on me. And yep. but when I do, I find myself at a quiet peace all day long. Yeah, yeah. I it's think that's amazing. That's great in that like intentionality. You will never be confident that you are building your life on Jesus with no intentionality to wanting to build my life on Jesus, right? Have you, is there any phase in your life where you accidentally built your life on Jesus? It's always because you chose it and because you put it as a priority. You're saying at the beginning of a day, you know, it's, it's a direction that I've chosen that I've set myself to for this day. And because of that, I have more assurance through the day that my life's being built on Jesus. Good. I was going to say too, I was just thinking on how Dwight's looking at this too and being younger in this culture. Yeah. And our culture says, Google it. Yeah. You're feeling a, cer feeling a certain way. Yeah. Google it. Yeah. You know, and go to maybe your friends or your peer group. Yeah. See how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. And maybe they'll help you out. And part of that intentionality with Christ is, like Charlie said, go into the word. <laughs> That's not popular yeah. in culture. Yeah. And hearing something that God has to say about, you know, like, you know, people say it tongue in cheek, you know, talk about Christians being lukewarm and, you know, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you drink, but, or I love Jesus, but I curse a little. Yeah. Well, does it grieve you when you do that in excess? Because yeah. if it doesn't, then how much, you, where, how much do you love Jesus? You know, yeah. where's your intentionality? Right. If, you know. I love my wife, if, but I cheat a little. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah, it, you know, it's like, it's that kind of thing. Right. It's. You yeah. know, but oh, oh yeah, but but right? using the <laughs> right? yeah. but using that intentionality, right? Just a little, because I really love her. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like but, it's the same kind yeah. of thing. It's just it's obnoxiously, but we don't right. see it. We're so blind to it. Right. We can't get out of our own way. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, I I know culture plays to that so much. Yeah. And especially with you know kids coming up today and technology and everything else, it's like that our, our yeah. culture just pushes that to the point where it goes. Uh, you know, do you really think, you know, Google's going to tell you what, you what feels good and looks good yeah. and sounds good. Scripture's going to tell you the truth and you might yep. not like it. Yeah. But you should listen to mm -hmm. it, you know. So yep. I will tell you this too about today's world. Um, and you've probably all done this to some point. Today's world allows you to have information that you did not earn. Like you said, Google it. Uh, whether it's medical or financial or some rumors about somebody or whatever, you didn't used to be you had to go through a certain process of earning that knowledge, you know, digging into books and studying and, and comprehending and going to school or whatever. Nowadays, you can type something in and get an answer, but you don't have the context or the capacity or the muscle to do. And, and that is bleeding over into our next generation Christian. You know, last night we had young adults here and you know, we're, dig we're digging into like, why does life sometimes feel awful? And what are we supposed to do about that? And we had a bunch of young adults here, but not all are young adults. You know what I mean? Because who wants to sit around for an hour and think this out and talk this out? And I mean, we got other stuff to do. And I, I don't want to put in the time or the energy or the awkwardness in the social circumstance or sacrifice my time. I, so reading the word of God, talking about the word of it, coming to, these are the things that like are antithetical to next generation. What I'm saying in, in our church is, does that matter to us? Are, in other words, are we s content to be passionate older believers and hope that next generation gets it somehow? Or is there something in us that's looking at next generation and saying, what do we got to do? Lord, give it, we have a heart for that. And that's got to, we've got to find the ways to connect and break through. Because I think there's a desperation in 20-somethings. You know, there, there's a reason that Netflix's most popular show, uh, two shows were NBC shows, The Office and Friends. And Friends is from the 90s. Like, it's from way back there. But the, the allure of a group of people that you can belong to, that will be with you through thick and thin, that it you know, stand by you and that you know real well and they know that is fascinating to today's young generation, right? Now you and I, we, we, we maybe watch that on a thing. We're like, yeah, that's unrealistic. It's funny, but whatever. It's unreal. But today's younger generation is looking at it like, that's what I want. That's what I'm shooting for. 
because they're longing for that kind of connectedness. What do we do with that? People who are isolated, people who know how to connect, pseudo-connect instead of really connect, people who know how to move from one thing to the next like that, but never to sit still and read a book and learn from it and digest a relationship with God that's frustrating and goes through time. And Well, you know, the, some of the reason I don't pass that on is because I haven't done that. Because I've bought into the convenience of today and I, I've idolized youth in that, oh, it's easy for them to use technology and whatever, and I don't have anything to say to them, but we've, we've kind of abdicated some of this bridge building, some of this, you matter to me, you know? And I'm not saying be creepy, but I am saying, do you, when you see, like, I'm not saying walk up to a young person like, you matter to me, like, they'd be like <laughs> okay, back up. But do they matter to you? Do you notice them when they come to our church? Do you pray for them? Do, if you hear of a need, do you find a way to meet it? Do you, do you build bridges to them? Do you encourage them? Do you, like, there's intentionality. I think we do a great job in, in, you know, the, as adults and believers and interacting. And I think our young people do a great job. But I think there's something about the body of Christ that we need to have it come together. And that's probably going to be on us. I doubt you're going to find like a 24-year-old come tackle you and be like, be, be, be close to me, <laughs> you know? But you finding that way to build a bridge to them, that matters. That really matters. And I think that's a big deal. But so just coming off of what you say, they Google it. Like to me, that's one of the issues that we have today is the, the, it takes endurance to learn the word of God and to build a relationship with Jesus Christ. But if it's not working in like five minutes, you know, what's a teenager do? <laughs> Moving on. Next, next, thing. next thing. Right to the next thing. Try the next one. Charlie. Right. Yeah. Yep. No. On our Twitter account, about I would say two weeks ago, something like that, I I retweeted something on that very topic, which was. A recent study has shown that the more time you spend on social media, the lonelier you are. Like clinical study, the more time you spend on social media, the more lonely you report to be. So it isn't just theory. It's fact. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if Alexa doesn't know it, <laughs> Siri doesn't know it, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She can quote it. Yeah, yeah, because if, if knowing it was the thing, Alexa would be good. Yeah, yeah. We, we won't delve any further, Georgia. We'll just, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. Yeah. All right, so I, first off, I need to apologize to all of you because I, I made a grand promise at the beginning of this that we would finish chapter two. We did not. We just almost finished the verse we were working on last week. 